everybody, Dave the Clone here, taking that daily coffee break, damn fine cup of coffee in hand, or hanging out by the water cooler, you know how we used to do back in the day when people used to surround water coolers at that thing we call work. Back with another 15 minutes of movie memory madness from the Hollow Nine Network. I hope you're enjoying the series, folks. So what are we talking about today? Well, it's a Polaroid. Oh, it's a Polaroid that's fading from clarity. Okay. It's shaking. It's shaking. Oh, wow. Now this guy has the force. A gun flies into his hand as a bullet flies back into the chamber. I guess that's a little bit of a foreshadow for what we're going to be dealing with way down the road in Tenet. But today we're talking about Christopher Nolan's mainstream breakout film, Memento. And before anybody gets all ready for it, this is not going to be some kind of psychological breakdown or exploration of Easter eggs or explanation of the ending, though I'll probably, you know, pontificate a little bit on some theories. But really, why I'm excited about talking about this movie is because, like all of the selections so far, for me... And the irony of how this show is sort of being designed is this one is definitely one of those movies that every single time I watch it, and I've watched it so many times <laughs> with different groups of people in different settings at different points, places, and stages in my life, I can vividly recall even almost the tactile feeling of what the air in the room was like the very first time I watched it during my senior year of college. And this is a movie, um, there are going to be a few in this series that I would probably describe in this way. Very much in the same way a drug addict is always looking for that very first high again with every new time that they use speaking of somebody in recovery 352 days sober at this point <laughs> awkward sorry um this movie very much to me feels like every time you're watching it you can't help but think to yourself man i really wish i could be seeing this for the first time again with a blank slate with no idea of how it's going to turn out because that experience especially for this film was so utterly gut punching and jaw dropping and in such a way like we were already prepared i think one of the things that was great about tarantino you know and pulp fiction was shifting the audience at large's conscious viewing habits and ability to digest a film out of chronological order and it's something that he then did in the next couple films or at least he did in um jackie brown a little bit and then other filmmakers started picking up on this uh and I think about like you know david fincher's fight club think about and this i mean really christopher nolan with memento now, for a lot of folks, this was their first Nolan, my first Nolan, and uh, for my, myself as well. I was in college, I believe that the psychology department, because I had taken a couple psychology courses, were hosting a viewing of the film. Now, I didn't go see that, but I was seeing posters all over campus, and uh at the time, I think I would call my mom once or twice a week just to kind of check in and say hello. And she asked me uh, right around the same time, like, so you know, like those synchronicities of the universe, kind of like me sitting down to record this at 11, 11 a.m. And I'm, I'm a big 11, 11 phenomenon head, if you want to call it that. There's plenty of rabbit hole there for people to go down on the phenomenon of what it means when you see 1111 or 1234, 222, 333, all of those things. But uh, in any case, and she said, hey, have you seen Memento? And I said, no. She goes, oh, you would love this movie. And I said, yeah, they're showing it at the psychology department. Uh, I may have just missed it, but uh, I'm gonna go look into if I can borrow it from the library. And as I would do at the time more often than not, I just 
you know, jumped on Amazon, ordered a copy, it arrived. These are the days way before Prime, okay? So you used to order something and then just have to like, oh God, let me try to forget about it for a couple days. And then it'll show up in my mail and it'll be like a, a, a happy surprise, birthday in July kind of thing when you're born in December. Um, yeah, just get used to this, folks. It's a little ADD today. A couple cups of coffee deep. In any case, get the movie. I'm by myself. None of my sweet mates are home. It's just me, some black lit ambiance in my room, maybe a little bit of uh, some herbal enhancement. And you put the movie on with zero understanding. I have never seen a trailer for the film. So this is a full, what I call a blank slate going in. You know, totally fresh. No idea what to expect. And the way at, you know, and this this also happened when a bunch of my friends and I watched Fight Club together. Because uh, none of us saw it in the theater. I don't know, there's this like weird period of time where I, I would see major commercial releases in the theater. But then they, there were some movies that, and I went to school in a, in a small town in Maryland called Chestertown. A little bit off the beaten path. First college ever founded in the U.S. after the colonies won the War of Independence. And we had a small theater in town. But because <laughs> it was a small theater in a small town, their selection wasn't always like the very high concept, heady stuff. And so if you wanted to see Fight Club, you either had to be, you know, home on break up in the New York metro area and go see it at some indie house. So we didn't see Fight Club, but I remember when we watched it, uh, a group of my friends and I, and we all had a suite together in one of the houses, and I will get back to Memento, I swear this is an episode about Memento. When we watched Fight Club for the first time, none of us were sober, uh, a lot of these stories, especially from that period of time in my life, are going to have to just assume the clothes on that one. Uh, as soon as the movie was over... I think two or three of us looked at each other and said, let's rewind that and start it again. And we wound up watching it a second time because you're just like, so much washes over you. And and it's, I think, meant to. It's meant to challenge the way you see life. It's meant to challenge the way you look at existence. It's meant to challenge the way you think about a lot of different social constructs. And very much in the same way, Memento. But Memento did so in much more of what I would say like a poetic sense. It, it was sort of, who would have ever thought, first of all, the concept of a character with a, a traumatic brain injury that leaves him with uh, anterior grade amnesia, or I hope that's correct, I should have googled this, obviously this is the other thing, <laughs> if I kick you off onto a journey that makes you go and educate yourself more about some of the things I might get wrong, my job here is done, but uh, basically the idea of short-term memory loss, like, you know, do you suffer from short-term memory loss, I think that was a Chumbawamba song, in any case, he can't make new memories, but any memories he had from prior to his injury are still crystal clear, so he knows who he is, he knows his life history up to the point where he had his brain injury, now the brain injury came about by waking up one night to find that their house had been broken into and his wife was being sexually assaulted in the bathroom and... I guess, you know, wherever this was, it was a state where it was very easy to have a handgun when you're not a law enforcement person, because he had a gun, he crashed into the bathroom, shoots the one perpetrator, doesn't realize there's a second one hiding in the room, and when he goes over to check on his wife, he gets cracked in the back of the skull with a blackjack, and here we go, on to this adventure. Now, the film's presented with two timelines which is crazy now that i have tenet to explain this with because it's very much like tenet it's a pincer move a temporal pincer move where one timeline we're seeing in bits and pieces that are playing out in reverse and the other timeline we're seeing in bits and pieces that are playing out moving forward and both by the end of the film converge at the same point and again not knowing that that is what you're in for that's the ride you're going to be taking with this movie you're sort of immediately i mean there's very 
it's it's sort of inarguable that Nolan's a genius. <laughs> it's um, as was discussed a bit in our Batman Legacy episode. As a filmmaker, he may be like our national treasure uh, and one of the last great filmmakers we have. He and David Fincher, since we brought uh, Fight Club up earlier, gotta keep that in mind. David Fincher, a little bit more of a meticulous, do a billion takes, kind of almost uh, in an Alfred Hitchcockian way, treating your actors like cattle. Um, but the product is is undeniable, you know. I mean, just watch Mind Hunter on Netflix, a tragic series left unfinished i have no idea how to feel about that probably the way i would feel if my memories would fade out of clarity in the very same way the opening shot of this movie you know the 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 brilliance of being able to telegraph the entire film which again you would only note after you go back and watch this whole thing again which is definitely i don't think i did it the night that i watched the movie but i knew I was going to have to watch it again, so I immediately emailed, this is back before, I mean, I think I had gotten my first cell phone during my senior year of college, but we had a, a campus internal email system called Blitzmail, and I immediately emailed three or four friends going, have you guys seen Memento? We have to have a viewing party of this tomorrow night. I just watched it. I don't know if I'll be able to sleep. My mind is reeling. This thing is amazing. Uh, and I do kind of think it's cool that the psychology department wanted to host a, a showing of it because it definitely brings up a lot of concepts that um, are spoken a little bit about in Psych 101, you know, how does memory work, what is actually going on in our brain, very similar to anyone who might ask, how does a hard drive save information, <laughs> you know, how does a spinning magnet keep data, I don't know, um, how does this <clears throat> um, wonderment of uh, existence called the human brain operate? And how it's as much a chemical, mechanical thing as it is a uh, psychologically, behavioral, choice-based system as well. You know, um, we're presented with a lot of things in the movie that show not only are we manipulated by forces outside of us, but that we tend to manipulate ourselves. And a lot of the, the whole story is really a revenge story uh, about this guy who's basically trying to get justice for his wife's death and his his story is that his wife did not survive the attack and that he was left with this brain injury and he has a limited amount of redacted data from the police investigation which was f which was fruitless the police did not believe him that there was a second assailant they just thought that he was Injured in his confrontation with the assailant that he wound up killing But there was a police officer from the investigation who did believe him and provided him with some of the information and they've been on a Journey to track down John G who is the that's the only thing they know as far as the identity of this uh, assailant goes he navigates his life by taking polaroid photos and immediately noting down what the photo is of so if he's staying in a motel he takes a photo of the outside he writes down the address he writes down the name he writes down eventually he learns to write down his room number <laughs> and as he meets different people he'll take photos of them and on the back write their name write their phone number write who they are write anything pertinent that he needs to know about them but he also has all these tattoos all over him. Very, very, like, next-level storytelling, you know? Because in the backwards sequences, we're very much aligned with somebody just getting used to this condition, right? Uh, we're seeing things where it kind of makes sense. We don't fully have the context because we're not sure what happened just before, uh, we're seeing the sort of after, so we just have to kind of trust the details we're given. Kind of like uh, another f film I watched recently from the 80s called White Sands. There's a, uh, a moment where Samuel L. Jackson makes a comment about loving photos because you have no idea the context. You just see the person in the photo, and it's just a moment captured in time. But if you weren't there and you didn't take the photo, you don't know what happened just before the photo got taken. You don't know what happened as soon as the photo was done being taken. You just see what you see. And very much like a photo, that is what Leonard's, played by uh, Guy Pierce, memory 
is like, and this is how his entire day is. And so we have to take everything sort of at face value and you're not really sure who to trust. You're not really sure what information he's getting is true or is being selectively curated to manipulate his journey. Uh, you know, very early on, we meet Teddy, uh, played by Joe Pantoliano, a, an actor that my father taught in high school in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. So shout out to Joey, Joey Pants, who you may also know from The Matrix and Sopranos and Goonies. I mean, no one talks about Goonies anymore. I have no idea why. Uh, maybe we will on this show because that one, even though it was a long time ago and I was very young, small, not smoking pot <laughs> when I saw that movie. I think I was in maybe first or second grade even. Um, but I do remember watching that for the first time as well. So yeah, that'll be a future episode. You hear it here first. Now write it down on the back of a Polaroid. Um, yeah, so we meet Teddy. Uh, we meet uh, the motel clerk who will you know, show up later in uh, Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins. Played by um, is it Mark Boone Jr., who was also in John Carpenter's Vampires. You, you've, you've seen this guy. He's been in a lot of stuff. And uh, so, you know, there are moments where it's clearly the chorus telling the audience what's going on, but then there's other moments where you're like, shit, is this guy the good guy? Is this guy a bad guy? What's going on? You know, and, uh, and you're kind of in that constant mode of questioning the entire time you're watching the movie. And the black and white, so one... one storyline is presented in color the other storyline the storyline that's moving forward chronologically is in black and white and it, it alternates between the two and it does so in such a way that you feel like the black and white one is supposed to explain how you're supposed to interpret the color one but you're seeing because you're seeing in the color sequences it's a, a leonard shelby who seems to be much more in control of what he's doing even though we never have the context and so like each scene starts out not each scene but many of the scenes start out um i guess the black and white scene starts out this one this way too the first black and white scene where he says you know ah man see i don't even know how to explain this let me think let me take a step back movie opens with him shaking a polaroid photo and it going from a crystal clear finished developing photo and every time he shakes it it's going back and getting cloudier and cloudier and we start to realize this is moving in reverse we see the polaroid go back into the camera we see a bullet casing uh come up off the ground and fly back into a gun that flies into his hand and i was suddenly struck with the realization that a lot of the stuff they did in star wars to have the force where people would pull things into their hands was just filming stuff in reverse <laughs> so cool right there exposing lucas um we see some blood move up a wall so clearly everything is going back to a point of origination and it gets back to him shooting somebody in the head we're like we're we're kind of we're witnessing him murder somebody at the very beginning of the movie then it cuts to the black and white scene and he goes and it's him waking up in bed and he's like okay i'm in a room I imagine it's probably my room. And it almost is kind of the way you would wake up with a hangover, right? When you don't really realize or remember what happened the night before. And you're kind of establishing your surroundings. And later we see a scene that picks up in the color sequence where he's running. And he's like, okay, I'm running. And where am I running? Am I running from? Oh, maybe I'm running from that guy, or am I running after that guy? And so he starts to turn towards this other guy who's running, and then that guy stops and starts, pulls out a gun and starts coming after him. He's like, oh no, I'm running from that guy. You know, and it's sort of like you get to see how challenging living this way would be, and you think to yourself, how in the hell would somebody with this kind of a situation actually be able to pull this off? How the hell is he in such control or at the level of confidence that he's at. And you realize it's like, this is part of this continuous delusion he has that he can live by his notes and his tattoos that are all sort of instructions 
and important information that he needs to hold on to. But when it's being explained to you in the black and white sequences, we goes, oh yeah, a tattoo is just a permanent form of keep, you know, keeping a note. And you start to learn to trust your own handwriting and you leave, you have to use post-it notes and Polaroids and uh, tattoo is just a permanent version of a note. And you're going, all right, well, that kind of makes sense. But when you finally get to the end of the movie, like ugh, there's so much that becomes up in the air and you're left really bewildered you know like there's a, a backstory about how he had been an insurance um investigator and in the course of that job he learned how to read people and he was able to tell when people were lying to him and then he had a very interesting case with a guy named sammy jenkis who had an injury very much like the injury he has now he he uh, was in a car accident and since then he could meant he couldn't make new memories uh, but he could do anything that he learned to do before the incident, no matter how complex. And this is illustrated by the fact that he's able to administer his wife's diabetes uh, insulin injections. And the Sammy Jenkins becomes a tragic story because his wife uh, struggled with believing that his ability was... Um, incurable and not just a sort of mental illness that could be trained away and the frustration with that and when she goes to visit Shelby as, as the insurance claims adjuster who denied the claim because after all the testing they did he was able to you know use technicality and loophole language to say that the um condition is psychological it's not physical in nature and therefore it's not covered under his policy and she comes to him just for some clarity like what is really going on here and a lot of this story is being told to us by Leonard in the black and white sequence where he's been getting these phone calls in his motel room and we don't know who's on the other end of the phone but it's almost like this mysterious voice that's pressing him and almost maybe by the questions it's at there, the voice is asking and the stories the voice is getting him to tell, manipulating him in some ways. We still don't know to what end at this point. And you kind of get the sense that he has a lot of guilt surrounding this particular anecdote because he told the wife that he believed that Sammy should physically be capable of making new memories and therefore she had renewed hope that she should be able to snap him out of his condition so she wound up setting up a test like a final test for him where she you know it was time for her insulin shot sammy gives her the shot she dials back her watch in front of him waits 15 minutes tells him that it's time for her shot he goes through the entire routine again and she's kind of got this you know incredulous i can't believe this is happening look she does it again and on that third time it was a lethal dose and he wound up killing his wife by the end of the movie it's implied that sammy may not have been real and this may have been an entire story about leonard after the accident uh, and what happened between him and his wife and how his wife actually survived the attack and she was the diabetic one and he projected all of this onto this fictional character of sammy to be able to justify what he is doing now in his life super high level mind fuckery you know and then with the way that these stories converge where we wind up seeing the adventure that leads to Sh leonard shooting teddy which is the very opening moment of the film again you really are left with this sort of existential crisis concept of how do we know what to trust? How do we know what's real? How do we know to trust our own memories? You know, and how would any of us, what would any of us be able to do if anything like this ever happened to us? And, and are we as much at fault for the manipulations we, and lies that we tell ourselves or, or allow to be enacted upon us? And, um, very, very, oh man, very, very cool stuff to, to play around with. Now, there, on the DVD that I, purchased there were supplemental materials including pages from a short story that christopher nolan's brother jonathan came up with and that concept when he told his brother about it is why christopher nolan wrote and directed the movie 
and in the movie's opening credits it says based on the short story by Jonathan Nolan which then was actually released a year after the film um, and that features some more definitive information that puts it much more in the camp of Leonard being the one who actually wound up in a mental institution and broke out and that Teddy is a character who not only was the cop who believed him but saw an opportunity to use this guy as the perfect assassin because he wouldn't really remember all the people they killed and so he's been setting up all these sort of uh, Patsy John G's most of the time they're criminals and drug dealers so it's not like the investigations into who killed them would be very um, high pressured or politically charged or anything like that and they would be able to sort of bounce around and continue to do this and uh, this particular case that we're witness to in the movie there's $200,000 in cash in Leonard's car and so you start to wonder I wonder how much money Teddy this has been probably Teddy building his retirement fund with the use of this guy um, mostly because you find out that they actually did find the person who quote unquote killed his wife and that after getting his revenge Leonard didn't remember it like like a like the reverse fading Polaroid his memory of it faded and it was almost like you restart the clock again you restart the whole story in his head very cool movie um and again like I said the nostalgia bomb factor of it like I can remember the sense of awe when I finished watching the first the first time and sorry for all the spoilering it's been I don't know 22 years <laughs> you had time um, even me telling you all that you're gonna watch the movie and be like what the hell is he talking if you haven't seen it you're gonna be like what the fuck was he talking about and then you're gonna get there and be like holy shit I've actually kind of given you a little bit of a compendium here to um, to maintain a sense of sanity and um reality check while you're watching it but every single time I can feel a slight tinge of like remembering what it was like not understanding what was happening and how unfortunately after you've seen it once much like the usual suspects right you can't unsee the big twist ending but now because you have that knowledge when you go back and watch it you pick up on all of these little details that are very intimidating as somebody who's got ambitions to make movies you start to think to yourself how in the hell i mean this is what a genius is this is what a real auteur if you will um the hallmark is that they were able to do this they were able to think of a way to tell this story so that all these things are working in concert whether they're hitting you from a subconscious level or a surface level it's just that it's like so perfectly built so for a my first nolan you get to kind of understand why he was able to then achieve the things he did later with movies like uh especially batman begins you know like the, this kind of focus on a on a superhero movie uh then you know inception <laughs> you know, we're gonna talk about some big ones there like inception and tenet tenet is another one that a lot of people um i don't think we're ready for but if you think about memento as a very um subtle forerunner of Type, the type of storytelling necessary it's it laid the groundwork for a story like tenet to be able to be told so memento it is memorable <laughs> you see what i did there very much a um a moment in time that i get to relive uh, in sort of a two-minded sense of uh remembering always like the memory being triggered but then also you being able to look at it through that lens of like oh my god it was right there oh my god look at that in this frame oh my god look at what she just said and how that connects to oh my god so much like i probably could talk about this for another hour or two but then there would be no reason for you to ever have to watch the movie so I suggest you go and do it. I think at the time I'm recording this in December of 2023, it's, I think, available either on Stars or Prime. But uh, it might even be Max, which I struggle to not say HBO Max, um, along with several other awesome films from this same nostalgic time period and earlier. 
I'm going to do my best to kind of keep it focused in a, in a bit of a past sense because I, I think there's something so much more fun about going through the nostalgia of being younger and having an impression from watching these movies and then going back in your early 40s with a lot more life experience under your belt <laughs> and a lot more perspective from which to critique and remember and see how your memories not are changed but are more uh, entertaining in a way because you say oh man I used to think this meant this but now having been heartbroken or having gone through tragic loss or having experienced the kind of fear that, that character is emoting on screen I get why this works and why the filmmaker did what they did and that's kind of the whole ball game here that's that's the whole point of why these water cooler coffee conversations are fun is because it makes m watching movies a much more interactive experience it's just that we don't always have those people to interact with anymore and so i'm trying to bring y'all into my world a little bit so please remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons smash the alarm bell <laughs> so that when we release new episodes of this series you will be informed and hit us up in the comments hit me up in the comments email me at hollow9podcast at gmail.com let me know what you remember about the first time you watched memento or heat or true romance or the blair witch project your book of shadows blair witch 2 or any of the batman movies from 1989 through 2022 uh or some of the other movies we've got uh episodes coming up or previously released about and i will be back next time with another damn fine cup of coffee to hit you up at the water cooler and say hey remember watching this movie until then i'm david clone have a good one. You've been listening to the Hollow Nine Network, bringing you the very best in fan-made media. That's the word hollow, the number nine, I-N-E. Find the Hollow Nine Network on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Rate and review us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. Email us at hollow9podcast at gmail.com. Leave us your feedback. Join in the conversation and be a part of the action. Join in the fun. Hollow 9.